you know, I know my children, especially as they get into teens, it's even worse, you know, because they don't remember anything. Mm-hmm. You know, how my husband doesn't forget? either, but that's another story. <laughs> yeah. How did you forget how to throw away that can? You're listening to the Nacho Kids Podcast, where we discuss all things step family related, real stories, real people, real help. Your hosts are the creators of the Nacho Kids Method and the Nacho Kids Academy Step Family Coaching Team, Lori and David Sims. Welcome to episode 231 of the Nacho Kids Podcast. What's up, y'all? What's up, y'all? Going into the uh, Thanksgiving season now. Yes, we are. Or at least for us uh, U.S. folks. Mm-hmm. The month of November. Is here. Yeah. So we have uh, that and then followed up by Christmas. And this is the (laughs) the most wonderful time of the year for blended families. (laughs) It is. Oh, man. The struggles of juggling around, you know, the exes and the kids and the scheduling. Man, I do not miss that. In fact, <laughs> now that we have grandkids, we still have to deal with that. <laughs> yes. And it stinks. Yeah, it does. Second generation blends. Yep. And it's a really hard time for step families for Thanksgiving, even Halloween, which we just had, and Christmas. But I know with you, David, you and your ex, you always had your kids Christmas Eve. Because her family did something Christmas Day. Yeah, we. This is one of the few times, maybe the only time, we actually went against the court order <laughs> because the court order kind of switched so that you know you would we would go from uh, Christmas Eve to Christmas Day and then Christmas Day to the day after, and it's supposed to switch every year. But because our families kind of had these standing times where they always did Christmas we were just able to um, to work with that. Yeah. Whereas I, on the other hand, every other Christmas Eve would attend your family things without my son. Yep. And it stunk. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to say that S word instead of the other S word. <laughs> yeah, it did. And the the thing I hated about it, in addition to him not being there, was that you weren't very happy. No. You know, so everybody else is having a great time. Everybody's like, what's wrong with Lori? I'm like, well, Jackson couldn't be here. She misses her baby. Yeah. So that's the downside because I wanted you to enjoy being there with my family and the kids and, and all that. But you were in a funk because J Funk couldn't be there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it got, it did get a little easier over the years, but it still stunk. Yeah. It did. Yep. You do the best you can do. And David mm-hmm. hates that phrase. So. <laughs> yep. And now that we have the grands, uh, even though we don't have to necessarily deal with trying to come up with this custody scheduling and all that kind of stuff, we have to deal with whatever the kids come up with. Mm-hmm. So now they have to deal <laughs> with the custody well, scheduling. But too, then we have to plan whatever around that schedule. Yeah. And so, for instance, sweet baby Layla's birthday is coming up. Well, Ethan has to try a way for us to have a party for her and for his mom to have a party for her. Mm -hmm. And people listening, I know you thinking, oh, my gosh, grow up. Y'all can be at one birthday party together. We (laughs) can, but it's going to be awkward. So it's best for everybody to have separate birthday parties. Yes, it is. Um. And and let me say this, and we say this probably every year, but it's always worth saying again, which is it is absolutely 150% okay to not have Thanksgiving on Thanksgiving Day or Christmas on Christmas Day or whatever on whatever day. Do what works. Right. You choose what day you want to celebrate, and that's okay. And Mm -hmm. if your kid believes in Santa... Then you can tell them that Santa comes to the blended family house a day late. (laughs) Or a week early in some cases. 
we've done that a week yeah. early and a week late. Yeah. I mean, if if my time to get the kids happened to be a week before the, the event, the holiday, then we just did it then. It was just yeah. easier. Look, we already have them. Let's just go ahead and do it. Well, you knew when you would have your kids. Mm-hmm. And I knew when I would have Jackson. So if we didn't have Jackson Christmas morning, then when we picked him up, that was our Christmas Eve. Right. And we would do Christmas Day the next day. Mm-hmm. But with your ex, she would get your kids on Christmas Day. And we didn't want the kids to get their presents and then have to leave for a week. Yep. So we ended up picking a day that everybody was going to be here. And if it was a week before or a week after, it didn't matter. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, matter of fact, the only people that it actually mattered to at all was the adults. The kids were like, heck yeah. <laughs> We get Christmas a week early. I know. We get it early. They they didn't have a preference, honestly, other than, like you said, they didn't want to get their stuff and then have to leave. Right. And so even a week late, they didn't complain because they had been at the other parents yeah. enjoying their toys. But anyway, all that being said, our guest today is Jason Kreidman. He is with Dad University. Oh, he is a recovering yeller (laughs) and a recovering complainer. Oh, wow. Well, now I understand why he didn't have any women in his group. (laughs) I actually asked him that. Why did you choose dads? Why couldn't it just be instead of dad university, be mindset university Uh or something like that? And he explains why. But. It's kind of like us. Most people that listen to our podcast are stepmoms mm-hmm. or stepdads, but there are some bio parents that listen to it and get some great knowledge from it. Yep. Yep. He said most people that reach out to him are new parents, you know, dads that just found out their wife or their girlfriend's pregnant. But that doesn't mean that what we talk about. It's not related to you. Mm-hmm. We talk about feeling guilty. Mm-hmm. You know, guilty parent syndrome, feeling guilty. We also talk about expectations. <laughs> Surprise. Well, all these things, it's interesting. You know, we talk about them from the standpoint of a blended family, but we see it often in nuclear families. Same thing. We we see the guilty parenting. We see the expectation issues. <laughs> yeah. We see them every day. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, I have a friend. I won't mention his or her name. <laughs> but uh, he had, look at her. Um, he had a lot of guilty parenting that was happening because of some things that, um, I guess the way he disciplined his kid when the kid was younger, then he found out the kid has some um some challenges we'll say and so he was disciplining him for these challenges that he didn't have a whole lot of control over and so he went into a i mean in my opinion it was kind of a dark darkerish place you know really blaming himself for disciplining his kid for something he couldn't control and all that uh so a lot of guilty parenting that happened around that for years and it's his bio child yeah 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 and I don't even know if it's not still happening, but um, it's a real thing. Yes, it is. All right. That's all I'm going to tell you. Good deal. Well, let's get to listening. Today, I have Jason Kreidman. Hey, Jason Kreidman. How are you? I'm good. How about yourself? Good. So we want to clarify, you are not in a blended family. Correct. But you do have kids. I do. I have a uh, 15-year-old son and a 13-year-old daughter. Okay. And how long have you and your wife been married? 17 years. Wow. Yeah. Long time. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Well, but, and we've known, and we've known each other since fourth grade. That's so So cool. That's a whole story in itself, but yeah. So tell us what you do. You have dad university, correct? Yeah. So I, I, I provide education for fathers. I, I help them go from 
uh, sort of chaotic and uh, overwhelmed to calm and confident is what we say. And, you know, we're just not given a manual on how to do this. And um, a lot of it was from my own journey. I, you know, while I came from what I would consider a good family, I, you know, my children were born and I didn't know what I was doing. I'm a recovering yeller, <laughs> oh. a recovering complainer. And I, I don't think, you, you know, you, you, I say, I say recovering because, you know, it's a daily process. Yes. It's, uh, it, it's something that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm always working on. And so, yeah, I just learned, uh, different techniques and, and felt like, um, you know, other fathers could benefit from this as well. There wasn't a lot of resources. And so I just continued my, edu- my own education on it, my own experiences and started doing podcasts and then eventually doing videos. And I'd say YouTube is sort of my, uh, primary audience. And then sort of like you were created a course or a membership and courses and, and community and where people can come and, you know, get help and understand what the heck is going on with these children. So. And I know for you, it sounds like it's like us, what we have learned that worked completely changed our lives. And it's not just in the blend that what we teach helps just like you. It's not just dads. It would help anybody. Yeah, I I think uh, you know a little bit of the difference of what I you call it teach or my advice and such. A tremendous amount of it comes from within. Um, mm-hmm. You know, in fact, like the first course that I did was called the Fatherhood Mindset, and it is really changing your the myths, the beliefs, the um, you know all of the stuff that you bring to the table when you become a father and how you respond and, you know, everything involved in that, that's, that's a huge part of what I teach. And, and that was also my own transformation. I just really took responsibility for myself and, you know, I started meditating. I, uh, you know, learned about empathy and gratitude and these different concepts that were but foreign for me. Right. And um, was able to, I, I wouldn't say the word fix, evolve myself. Mm-hmm. And as a result, have much better relationships with my children and be able to parent better. So let's talk about some things that you help bio dads with. Because our stepmoms struggle with the relationship their partner has with their partner's bio kids. Follow me? Yes. Yes. So... How how can we help them to understand some of the things that they see and change their mindset? Because one of my biggest things in the Nacho Kids Academy is change your stinking thinking. Mm-hmm. I love that challenge. It's a 30-day challenge, but it's got to be a 30-day challenge. And it's just awesome, and it completely changes people's lives. And I was actually listening to the Hidden Brain podcast this morning, and one of the things they were talking about, it was an old one, was mindset. You can find the bad in anything, but you can also find the good in anything. Yeah. I can provide, I think I actually can provide a little bit of advice if they're willing to listen to the stepmoms, and maybe not the word advice, but maybe perspective. Yes. Of of hearing it from the male's perspective of what works. And how, you know, because a lot of the questions I get, because I, you know, I teach primarily men, right? but I do have a lot of women who listen to material, they watch the videos, they comment. And a lot of it, not all, but a lot of it has to do with, you know, how can I get my husband to X, you know, (laughs) how can I convince him to Y, you know, and I, I think there are some some things that they can do, you know, in that sense. Now, there are plenty of situations where the man does what she's talking about. You know, that's not something she doesn't feel like it's her responsibility. Of course, she shouldn't. But those women, and there are, you know, many out there that still are like, wish he would just do this or help with that. Or, and, you know, that that is a real request that happens. So, I've got a couple of things I certainly could share um, yeah. that I think, I, you know, I think could be helpful and, and probably 
you know, this is one of the hard ones uh, to accept and realize is that there is more than one way of doing something. Oh, definitely. That's that's the first tip. <laughs> right. Why did you choose to just do dads? Why didn't you make it Mindset University? Yeah, I I I think um, there was a couple things. One, I was looking at you know my own growth and my own change, and felt like other fathers, you know, could, could do this and could benefit from some of the changes that I'd made, some of the information that I had learned, the teachings that I'd studied, and. You know, and then from a business standpoint, there's a couple reasons that I would go into this only dads, and there's a couple reasons why not to. The reason I did want to was just focus. Right. Um, there are so many parenting coaches, parenting experts, um, a lot of you know people that are involved with moms. So there's a tremendous amount of competition. At the same time, there's a lot more demand. Mm -hmm. Um, my background is in search engine optimization. And so I understand demand quite a bit. And the curiosity in me is, was that the fact that there wasn't a tremendous demand for men and that was intriguing. And so for me, I did feel like there was a shift that was happening. It was, you know, this sort of more men stepping forward, more, dads getting more involved. I mean, even statistics will show that, that, you know, me, you know, obviously dads are more involved now, whether it's per hour or whatever than they used to be, even if it's not quote enough. The, right. and so I, I just really felt like if I was going to make impact, I, and that was my focus, it wasn't doing a business. I, I wasn't actually looking to start a business. I was looking to share my own experiences and, and provide value. And as a result of that, it started, you know, forming into a business. Yeah. Same here. Um, yeah. And, and so I think it was, it, it wasn't intentional at first. It was really just, I think, Hey, there's other people that are going to benefit from this. Um, and quite frankly, I just felt more comfortable talking to fathers. And, and if I look back, actually the very specific thing was, and I don't want to go too far into it, but basically my mother had passed away. My mother was an author and seminar speaker on relationships. And she had been very successful. And, and when she passed away, I went to grief counseling. And I went to grief counseling with a group of men. And at first I was like, that's strange. Why would, why, like, why would I go to a, a group of men? Mm -hmm. And what I slowly realized is how different that experience was versus when I did go to a group of women, you know, group of anybody. Right. The men felt safe. They felt less judged, surprisingly, because, you know, men judge each other, mm -hmm. but it was a very different environment. And that was intriguing to me as well. So, you know, same thing. I think like when you have a bunch of women together, they'll talk in their own way. Men will be and do the same thing as well. And they will talk in a way that can be vulnerable and can really, you know, add benefit. They'll say things that they normally wouldn't say or that they won't say in the in the presence of a woman. And and so I think that was intriguing to me also. And so that's that's kind of how it all formulated and it's evolved. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like us. We focus on blended families, although the Nacho Kid parenting method can be used outside of the blend and help people in life in general. And we say it's a way of life because it truly is. Once you learn these tools to change your mindset and to be more positive, it affects the people around you. It affects your health. It's amazing that it can change the levels of whatever in your blood, the oxygen levels and all that in your blood, just from not being so negative. Yeah. Yeah. There's some universal truths that sort of help you in every aspect of your life. I agree. I mean, you know. When I learned empathy, it certainly helped my marriage and as well as people that I worked around and my friendships and such. You know, I had a friend call me the other day with a really difficult situation. And in the old days, I would have just told him how to fix it, mm -hmm. you know, and instead I just listened and I said, wow, I mean, that seems like that's a real difficult thing that you're going through. And I'm really sorry that you're going through that. Right. That was it. Mm -hmm. and I learned when I learned to do that with my wife, things changed a lot too. Yes, because we yeah. don't want you to fix it. Oh, 
No, I, I only took, it only took me 40 something years to learn that. Yeah. So. We want you to mm-hmm. hear us get it out. We got to get it out. Yep. And if anything, just sit there and say, I understand. Or yeah. you don't have to say that you agree. You don't have to say anything else, but please, for the love of God, don't tell me how to fix it. <laughs> yep. That I learned that in the book, the men are from Mars, women are from Venus or whatever it is. Right. Right. Yep. That's, that's, uh, that was sort of, um, it's funny because my mother was a sort of, that was a competition of my mom's and, um, you know, I wasn't keen on learning that, or if I did learn it, um, I didn't apply it to children. You know, when I had kids, I just, I, I didn't see myself as the three-year-old daughter who their father is yelling at them to go find their shoes. Right. You know, I, to me, I was looking at it's like, okay, you lost your shoes. Well, go get another pair. Right. You know, oh, that was your favorite pair of shoes. That's the shoes that you've worn the last, you know, 10 days in a row. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. it's a different perspective when you think about it and you look at that. And, and as a result of it, you parent differently. Yes. And or um, don't parent so that differently. Empathetic part. <laughs> Yeah. 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 It's uh it, so that's been that's been very valuable. I I would say another another value that you know women or the the moms can take away is you know the writing down of responsibilities of actually having a meeting and communicating and being very very clear who is responsible for what mm-hmm. and making sure that both parties are included in that, you know, creation versus, you know, Hey, listen, this is the list of things I need you to do, or this is the things that, you know, it's, Hey, we need to get all these things done, you know, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, let's look at, you know, what are the things that you could take on or that you prefer? I take, you know, et cetera. And like, and then it becomes a conversation. Right. And then, you know, and when someone is in that conversation and gets to choose, they are more likely to follow through with that. And so, you know, I think as it relates to, let's say, responsibilities around the house, responsibilities with the children, you know, that's a communication thing. But even more so, it is writing it down. It's literally I'm in charge of dinner on Thursday nights. Mm-hmm. You know, I tuck the kids in on Tuesday, you know, on Wednesday when we don't have X, ex- you know, it's it's being very, very clear on what the responsibilities are. Mm-hmm. And I don't think couples and families, and, and even with that, you know, I have things where I include the kids in on those conversations. Everybody has ownership, right? You know, they have ownership of it. They've, and even my kids of saying like, okay, you know, what are the three things that you could get done today? And they get to choose, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't, I may not, you know, sometimes I dictate it to them, but mm-hmm. You know, in general, it's it's like when you when you give people the autonomy to choose or the autonomy to have input and and specifically ownership, they often get it done. And that that's something that I think as a as a couple, you know, is an important thing. And that goes down to communication and everything else. So. Right. And that's one thing that we recommend to the stepmom or the stepdad and the bio mom and the bio dad to split the house chores between the adults. And then the adults can decide if they want to ask the kids to do it or if they're going to choose to do it. That way they're accountable for that chore. Yeah. And I have a thing, even writing down the responsibilities. I mean, because, you know, I know my children, especially as they get into teens, it's even worse, you know, because they don't remember anything. Mm-hmm. You know, how my husband doesn't forget? either, but that's another story. <laughs> yeah. How did you forget how to throw away that can? You know, mm-hmm. would I just I just didn't know because there's six of them there that you must not have remembered you right. know, how to throw that away. And, and a teenage brain is I mean, I'm that's a whole other dynamic that I'm you know, it's new to me. And so I, I will be putting out obviously teen material or much more. Of it soon. Yeah, like I'm starting to put out step grandparent material. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So dads that come to you. What is their biggest struggle or their biggest challenge? I think a lot of it is the unknown, you know, especially on YouTube, a tremendous amount of the audience either just found out that they're pregnant because it kind of skews a little younger, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, They either just found out they're pregnant or, you know, they're in the middle of pregnancy or they just had the child. And, uh, you know, a man doesn't go to the dentist until his tooth hurts. So, 
Um, you know, same thing here. It's like until the kid is in a situation or, you know, and the, the father needs to figure it out, they're, they're not looking online to sort of prep for that. Some are, but so I, I think in general, the majority of them are coming to, you know, hence the name dad university, they're coming just because of the unknown. They right. may not have had a father figure. If they did, they don't like it. They didn't get along with that father figure or they want to do things differently than their father did. I mean, that, that's a lot of what I see. Hmm. And and so it, it's just people trying to arm themselves with information. Right. You know? I, I, I can't necessarily say that there's, you know, one specific thing. Although I will say during the pregnancy, especially a huge one is how can I help my significant other? Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah. I mean, that is a, that is a really big call it, you know, search item or whatever, but it's, you know, it's how can I help? Because mm-hmm. they sometimes feel left out. You know, everyone's making such a big deal about, oh, you're pregnant, you know, for her, you're pregnant, there's the baby shower, there's this, there's everyone sort of attentive. And I mean, she is carrying the baby. It's a lot more work. Right. Uh, but the father often feels left out. And, you know, his world is about to change. He's has more pressure on him. He has, um, you know, the dynamic of who he is as a man is changing. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a, I, I, when I first started, I had a, a group that, and this was like my support group was called dudes to dads. And that was the whole crux of it is like these changes that you go through when you are first becoming a father are, are just huge. You know, the emotional swings I'm, I'm, and I'm not discounting anything. Women are going through a ton of stuff themselves, but you know, the identi- identifying that men do go through a lot. And I just don't think people recognize it. I think men often do it in silence. Mm-hmm. And, you know, whether it's societal, cultural, ego, you know, we just, we kind of suffer in silence and, and whether it's depression or other things take on, you know, there's, there's more addiction, you know, alcohol abuse, porn, there's all kinds of things that happen as a result of it. Men just show it in a different way. Yeah. And that's true. yeah. And, and I think it's a very, it's a very emotional time and a very emotional state that men go through with very little support. Yeah. And I guess we would probably see 10% of men joining Nacho Kids. I've actually mm-hmm. seen it increase here lately. But Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And it's mainly stepdads that are struggling mm-hmm. more than the bio dads. But of course, they could be bio dads too. Sure. You know, it gets convoluted. You start talking about everybody's role. What do you think, like the dad that parents out of guilt, do you talk to them about that? Yeah, well, usually if if you are guilty, um, if you feel guilty, you typically are. Um, that's a, that's, that's, you know, that's a good saying. Um, I, I think guilt is only good if it brings about change, you know, otherwise it's useless, you know, feeling guilty. Like we often do that. Like we feel guilt. Let's say, you know, our friend has a party and we decide just, we don't want to go. Mm-hmm. And so we feel guilty about it. The reason we feel guilty is that somehow we, f- we think that that makes it better. Like if we cause ourselves pain or um anguish about it then it's it, it, then it was a better decision or like that we are okay with whatever the impact it was mm-hmm. and the truth is is that it's a waste of our energy i mean guilt guilt is a really wasted emotion right um i completely unless agree unless it causes action right and positive action or causes change of some kind Positive yeah. action. So, I mean, if you're guilty, you know, if you feel guilty of not spending enough time with your children and as a result of that, you end up spending time with more time with your children, then that's fine. Mm-hmm. Then guilt was, you know, guilt was a good thing. Right. Um, you know, and I don't necessarily believe in guilting other people either. I mean, you shouldn't be, you know, we have the decision of whether we want to feel guilty or not. And, um, you know, I think, I think it probably goes both ways, but I can only talk from the man's experience that I think there are many women who want or try for him to feel guilty because in some way that may make them feel better. Now, I'm sure it goes the other way around. I just don't have that perspective. But, right. you know, we guilt 
you know, men probably do it with intimacy. Um, mm -hmm. We try to, you try to guilt the woman. Well, it's like, oh, well, we, you know, we haven't been together for, you know, very often. Or, you know, or the woman will say something about, you know, doing things around the house and guilting him. And so it's used as like this weird tactic that, I mean, personally, I just, I don't like it, you know? Yeah. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a big uh, one in our house. Let's just say. Yeah. Because in my experience, for instance, say the stepmom doesn't want to go to the stepkids baseball game. She just has no desire to go. Mm -hmm. And then she starts feeling guilty about it. Well, she is. Well, then <laughs> she'll decide to go. So she won't feel guilty, but she's miserable and makes everybody else miserable because she didn't want to be there in the first place. Right. Well, that's where empathy comes in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, the one, the thing that, that can be done is to actually put yourself in the place of the child. And, and instead of looking at it, well, this game is going to just, it's horrible. It's boring, you know, whatever, you know, I have to bring my adult juice, you know, or, you know, whatever it is, instead looking at it from the child's perspective and saying, you know, and that doesn't have to be done 24 seven. I mean, it's not like you always have to look at it from the kid's perspective, but in an instance like that, you can, and you can say, wow, let's, okay, let me see. If I was a seven-year-old and I, my dad had this other woman who came into his life, but she's showing up at my game. That's kind of cool. You know, that, that, that may be an opportunity to sort of get in. And I mean, cause one of the things you have to do is you have to appeal to the children with their, in their interest. Right. You know, and I mean, and that goes whether you're whether you're a blended or not. I mean, that's the same thing for bio. It's you know when a when a parent doesn't feel very close to their child, the thing that you do is you get into their world. That will help you feel close to them. You know, if my son wants to play video games, guess what? I don't like playing video games anymore. I did as a kid, um, but it was important to him. Like. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so if I sat down for 20, 30 minutes and, and played video games, he absolutely loved it, you know? Right. My daughter, you know, she has her own interests, you know, she was into drawing or, you know, she was doing a uh, jump rope for a long time. And she's like, dad, you know, jump rope. I'm like, oh, okay. How long have you been doing the dad university? Uh, I mean, I, it's inception was probably eight or nine years ago, you know, seriously. And actually like, Business wise, probably four or five years. Okay. So you don't really so have dads come to you that are already in families and they are actually in blended families. No, we do. Um, we do all the time. In, in fact, you know, that that is an audience. I sometimes am hesitant, especially if I'm the one giving advice, if I don't have that specific experience. Right. You know, right. you know you so, what you know. Yeah. And, and, and granted, I, and I, and I can say, well, Hey, if I was in that situation, here's how I might handle it, but it's not as, um, it's not as legitimate as, you know, you know, I even have, as an example, um, I have a, a, a video it's done pretty well. It's a, it's about, you know, teen pregnancy. If you're a teen dad, well, I wasn't a teen dad, but how I view it is all the people that have come to me or if my son came to me and said, Hey dad, I guess what? How would I handle it? And, or how would I want him to handle it? Or how, if, if I did, what would I do? You know, of course it's different when you're not in it yourself. Right. But I've always, I, I learned this very early from my mother is, you know, when you're in a situation that you don't know what to do, think of your best friend or your child coming to you in that exact situation. What advice would you give them? Right. And we we often would give them much better advice than we would take ourselves. Oh yeah, and that's good advice. It really is. Yeah. So I'm thinking you deal with dads being dads. That's what y'all talk about, right? This <laughs> this isn't some kind of secret club that y'all talk about boating, right? Of course. Of course, I can't tell you. So if a yeah. guy comes to you and says, "My wife is extremely unhappy." Mm -hmm. And we fight about the kids. Now, this could be bio kids, step kids, the mixture of whatever. 
but there's a struggle there. Yep. What would you talk them through kind of? No, I, I understand. I, I think, I mean, there's no, you know, there's no uh, 60 character answer. No, of course not. You know, to it. I, I think it's really understanding the under, under sort of belly of the question or, you know, of the situation. Oftentimes, a lot of the things that we think are bothering us are very, very surface. Right. You know, you got to find I, I the mean, root. Yeah. I mean, I'll, let me, I'll come up with a, a brief example. It's like, you know, one of the, ki- one of the parents is like, or maybe let's say the stepmom is really jealous about um, the attention that her husband is giving to the kids. You know, she feels like she doesn't get as much, you know, this is just a random. Perfect. No, but that's perfect. That, that can be, I mean, there's a lot of deep psychology. It could be her own attachment style. It's what happened to her as a child. Mm-hmm. It's you know her own father abandoned her. I mean, there's there's so many possibilities of what that is. And so, I mean, a lot of times I think therapy is the way to do that. Um, you know, and if it's not that, it's some sort of whether whether it's a coaching program, it's a program like yours, it's it's something that'll dive into why do I feel this way? Mm-hmm. And not, and it's not how does that why is this other person make me feel this way? That's the last thing you should be answering or asking. It's why do I feel this way? What is it about me that causes me to feel this way? And typically that is I'm scared. I'm, uh, you know, I don't feel safe in this relationship. I don't trust somebody. I was hurt in the past. I mean, there's there's a ton of, of things and reasons why. Mm-hmm. It all comes from our own crap. Right. And, you know, when you are whole, let's use that example, you don't, you're not bothered by other people so much. You know, you look, I look at like some of these spiritual gurus. Like I listen to a lot of that stuff, like, you know, Sadhguru or Gandhi or these you can yell and scream at these people and they are not going to sway or get upset. Mm-hmm. And that is because they are the ones who control their own emotions. Now, it's not that they don't feel or they don't have a, an opinion or they don't have anything. But, you know, so much of the time that we get upset, we we think it's the other person and it's not. No, it's us. It's our reaction. Right. Yeah. I think we have to take responsibility. Yeah, I think we have to take responsibility and say, why am I feeling this way? What is it about me that causes me to feel insecure or to feel jealous or... You know, and that doesn't excuse the behavior on the other side. Mm -hmm. It's just understanding what, you know, you can't solve anything without really understanding why you're doing something or what is the cause. And uh, like I said, oftentimes it's so surface, we think so surfacely. Right. And it's not, you know, this is the deep stuff. Your childhood has an effect on you. Yeah. So you said that a lot of women come to you like, how do I get my husband to blah, blah, blah. (laughs) Yeah. So question for you, how do I get my husband to pick up after himself? So if you've already expressed how important it is to do that, I think part of it is the responsibility discussion and and taking that ownership. Now, that's one thing. The other thing is the picking up after himself is your preference. It's not his. Right. And so there is more than one way to do it. Like the truth is, and this might be a little bit harsh, is that the the person who needs it clean, it's their need. Right. And forcing someone, what you have to realize is that you are then forcing or asking, if we say it nicely, someone to do things your way. That's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Your expectations. Yeah, it is. It's expectations. And so I think it is more of a discussion, an honest discussion about that and saying, listen, I understand you have a different, you know, your level of cleanliness is different. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and, and and I respect that. Now, mine is this. So how can we meet in the middle? What what? And you actually ask the other person. You say, what are some of the things or what's a suggestion that you might have? And now they may answer and say, well, just don't worry about it. And 
the truth is, is that, I mean, that, that, you know, this can be a long answer too, is that you might have separate areas, you know, Mm -hmm. and here's, here's the hard part. Why are they wrong? And you are right. Right. Because clean is better. That's, I mean, I agree, but that's not the right answer. Right. You know, that's where the fact is, is when you are living with somebody else and they have a different way of living, we think our way of living is correct. Mm -hmm. And which it is, we know. Yeah. And so that becomes very difficult. I do think that there are some things that, you know, some little tasks and things that you can do as an example, that when you do see him clean something up, you give him a tremendous amount of praise and gratitude, not cheesy, not like a kid, but just say, you know what, honey, I, I saw that you cleaned up the dishes earlier. I just, I really appreciate that. And you give him a quick kiss or a hug or something. Like, but here's my thing. <laughs> yeah. As a woman, nobody ever thanks me for doing dishes. Correct. But, but I even thank David when he does the dishes. And after I thank him, I'm like, why am I thanking him? He ate off those plates. Well, that's what I'm trying to teach men to do. Is to say thank you? Is express gratitude. Right. And they'll realize how much they can get out of life with that, you know? Mm-hmm. And I mean that that you're you're absolutely right. It's now at the same time, what I would say to that, and this is easier said than done, is it's not a score sheet. You, you know, we the best thing that we can do is be us and do our thing the way that we are. And if you are saying thank you and saying those things because you want the other person to do it back, then you're fishing. Right. And you will never succeed in fishing. It's just, it's a, it's a zero sum game. And so that's why, I mean, we have to practice our own gratitude and, and, and look at the things that we can appreciate now. So he may not clean up after himself, but he went and put gas in your car or, you know, he took the kids X, Y, Z, whatever. I mean, we, we, it's so much more valuable to focus on the things that are working and that go well and what we can be appreciative for. But I will say, if you express gratitude, you better believe that he'll do it again. You know, men, men, especially, I mean, I, you know, my wife has said, I like clean the kitchen, you know, and a lot of times she'll she's in there more and so she's cleaning the kitchen but i cleaned it once she i couldn't believe how excited she was now <laughs> you don't think that i ever then clean the kitchen again of course i think about wiping down the counters all the time yeah <laughs> i mean she came over kissed me hugged me what is it was like oh my gosh this is so helpful thank you so, she knows right and guess what when there's dirt there i wipe the counters down now, I don't do it in the hopes of getting hugs and kisses, but if it happens to happen, then I'm okay with it. But do you thank her when she does the dishes? I say almost every day that I can't believe that my socks all of a sudden appeared back in my drawer. <laughs> it's like the ongoing joke that we have. I'm like, somehow my underwear and socks just like keep the new ones fresh. Yeah, it's keep clean. replenishing. They keep coming back no matter what I do. And, and so that's an ongoing joke. Yeah, I try. I, I mean, I, ex- I, I do my gratitudes in the morning. It, it, it's a big thing for me. Gratitude has become, because I was so focused on all the negative for so long. Oh yeah. And it's you know? easy to do. I'm sure in your research or in life, you have ran across Dr. Daniel Amen. Mm-hmm. I love him. He does a lot of research with concussions on football players and things like that, Alzheimer's patients, just the brain yep. in general. Yep. And it's amazing. Yeah, I think it's his TED Talk or something. Yeah, one of the things that he talks about is automatic negative thinking. Yeah. And you don't realize you do it. And if we say it out loud, yeah, if we say it out loud, it magnifies it. And, yeah, so um, if, you, if somebody listened to this, think about how many negative thoughts you think you will have in a day. From 8 o'clock in the morning or 6 o'clock in the morning when you get up to 9 o'clock at night when you go to bed. How many wow. negative thoughts do you think you'll have? Most people will say 10. Wasn't it 60,000? Wasn't it 60,000 or something like that? Well, you have like 60,000 thoughts. And of those, yeah. a percentage of them are negative. Yeah. And, of course, you can change that percentage. But you can change it. 
And that's the thing. And you don't realize how much control you do have over your life. We see that often as not appreciative of what we want or or of a desire we have. And that's why I think that discussion becomes, listen, I know it makes no difference to you about picking up the stuff. Like you could care less. I know it feels like I'm nitpicking. Like, but for me, the feeling of coming into a clean room just feels really, really nice for me. And so I'm trying to figure out how can we work together so that, you know, I understand it's not going to be spick and span every day, Mm -hmm. but what can we do so that that for me, that would feel really nice, you know? And, you know, hopefully you have an understanding spouse that is willing to do something as a result of that. I think a lot of it is in the delivery and how we approach it. Yes. And most of the people we deal with, they're just at their wits end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that is often, you know, when, when people decide to do something. No desire to be a parent. There are some instances where, you know, they're let's say they're pregnant. And I've had some material and some videos and some comments that have been hopefully life-changing. I, I mean, I'd love to think that. Where they say, wow. I didn't realize how important this actually is for me to be involved. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, I think once in a while, a light bulb will go off and they'll, you know, they'll see enough, but, but they were looking, you know, there was something that they were looking at. Okay. What do I do? You know, my girlfriend's pregnant. What do I do? Or, um, you know, I'm a teen dad, same thing. Like, what do I do? And, you know, how to be a dad. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, you know, even in that sense, like they are looking. You know, they are they are looking for some kind of direction and have some interest in it. I think for those fathers who have don't have an interest um, and, and occasionally will get some comments on like other videos that I have. You know, I'm not trying to convince the inconvincible. So that's the word or non convincible. Um, you know, it's, it's the same thing in sales. Like if you're not interested, I'm not going to try to, I'm not trying to sell you. I have something really valuable and you can choose whether it's valuable for you, you know? Yeah, same here. It's like, I want to tell people about the Nacho Kids Academy when I see them struggling and the yeah. Facebook group, but then I feel salesy and I don't want to feel salesy, but I want to say, if you want help, you need to do the work, but I can help you to know what to do to better your life. Well, like anything, they, they have to want to. Yeah, they have to value it. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, just from my own experiences, I mean, women are much more inclined to do something about it than fa- than men are. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I have a tough crowd. It's a very, very tough crowd. And so for the men who do make the decision, yeah, you know, Hey, I'd like to do something, or I'd like to be a little bit better dad, or I want to be more involved. It's like, that's what we're trying to push. You know, that is the narrative, if you will, of getting more fathers involved and interested and you know, when I took, I, I was studying to be a parent coach and took like licensing. I was the only male in there. Oh, of course. You know, it was 12 women and me, you know. <laughs> um, and, and even when we took the initial parenting classes, just my wife had saw them at like the preschool when my son was in preschool. Same thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was just the moms were the ones doing it. And that that just really bothered me. It, it was like, because I always felt it was a 50-50 deal. Do you think it could be because of the roles women had oh, yeah. back in the day versus men? Yeah, I mean, even, and I and I caveat what I said about 50-50 is, is, as an example, my wife stayed home for a bit and then was working part-time while I was full-time. Mm-hmm. And that was just the agreement that we made. So from a, you know, spending time standpoint, you know, my wife was the primary caregiver. Um, and that is, you know, that happens in a lot of families and a majority of families. Now it's not every family. Um, I actually sponsor a, a stay at home dad organization. Oh, really? And yeah. They have a conference every year and it's like, I mean, you want to see the other side. It's amazing. You know, these are fathers who, you know, just love it. You know, the majority of role that role, you know, falls in that place. So, um, but as far as like the parenting, you know, when they get to like, let's say three, four five, et cetera, 
and there's actual communication and stuff. I, to me, it's, you know, it's a 50, 50 deal. I never thought of it any other way. Right. You know, and, and my wife and I each have our strengths in those areas. And, you know, we often, but it's a very equal partnership in that sense. You know? Now you said you were a yeller. Recovering. Recovering yeller. My mom <laughs> was a yeller. I guess I'm a recovering yeller. Yeah. And I get it because that's how my mom was. Well, I didn't know any other way. Right. And I met Celia Kibler. I don't know if you know who she is, but she does a lot with mm-hmm. parents. And one of her things is to not yell. Yeah. And she asked me one simple question when I talked to her one day. And that was my answer of why not to yell. She said, how did you feel when your mom yelled at you? Right. I'm like, like crap. And she said, do you want Jackson to feel like crap? said, no, not really. <laughs> Unless I'm wanting him to feel guilty to make me feel better about a decision he made. Well, yeah, both yelling and complaining. I mean, they're kind of in the same camp. They're not effective tools of communication. Right. You know, if you, if you study communication, nothing in there says complain or yell. I, I don't know that there's any expert or specialist or scientist of communication that would ever say that. So, Okay, so I have a question. Yeah. My son told me the other day that I was complaining. We were at a restaurant and they were out of say green beans and something else, chicken. And I said, I just can't believe that they're out of those two things because that's something that you would think they sell a lot of. And he thinks that that is complaining. I feel it is stating a fact. How do you distinguish between complaining and stating a fact? Yeah. I mean, well, it has opinion. You know, them being out of chicken and green beans is a fact. But you not being able to believe it is an, an opinion. Is that, if that yeah. kind of makes sense? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think any time that we add our opinion into something that, and, and it's a negative opinion, you know, it. But why is that perceived as negative? Why is it well, neutral? I, the fact that they don't um, have these two things. No, I, I, I could see, I, I mean, I, I could see your son's point of view. I, I understand it. I, you know, the, the question actually, so it was my wife that was very instrumental in re- helping me recover. And one of the things she had said is, can you do anything about it? And because I would complain and she's like, you're allowed one, you're allowed to complain like the first time. This is how it started. You know, and maybe I cut my hand or something. And I was like, wow, that hurts. But okay, great. It hurts. Now what do we do? You know, she was a nurse. Right. There's nothing else you <laughs> like, can do. Move on. Like, yeah, take action. Right. You know, sew it up, put a Band-Aid on it, tape it, you know, whatever. Like, and so for her, it was a very eye-opening for me too of like, can you do something about it? Right. And so I think in an instance like that, it's just negative opinion. And negative opinion isn't attractive. Right. In any sense. You know, I mean, you're talking whether it's politics, religion, or just what's going on in the world. When you talk negatively, it's just not that attractive. It can be a fact. But I just, I think it repels a lot of people versus, you know, let's just say that example. And you could, and you say, now I'm not, you know, you say, okay, so they don't have green beans. They don't have chicken, which is my normal thing. And you would think a place like this, gosh, but Hey, this might be an opportunity for, for me to try something new. Right. You know, and it's just a different, it, like you can almost sandwich it with an, you know, the negative with the positive. Yeah. I don't mean to put you on the spot with this question because it's interesting. I'm still of the thought process that I did not have any negative connotation to the feeling or thought when I said it. So, well, that's interpretation, though. That's the interpretation that you're trying. He has. is interpreting it as I'm complaining. I'm stating it as a fact. I wouldn't normally get the chicken or the green beans, but I knew they were out of them because they told somebody else. Or even if I had, but you not believing it is an opinion. Okay, I'll have to think on that one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I see what and, you're saying. Or as but we always say, let's agree to disagree. <laughs> like, yeah. 
Because you can. And, and the fact is, here's, here's the other part too. This comes with mindset and everything else is we are all a sum of our past, our experiences, our culture, our families, you know, all of the things that we've been through affect how we think in our perspective. So as a result of that, that's why you have a ton of people who are offended by everything. Mm -hmm. Whereas you could say a lot to me. I don't really get offended. Yeah. Me you either. could make fun of, I mean, even people online make fun of the way I look or the way I sound or yeah. the way that I do, whatever. It doesn't offend me. And so there are people you could say, oh my gosh, she was wearing X, Y, Z and they're offended. Right. So now we can think of that as weak, we can, but that is a, that is a result of their history, lack of resilience, you know, all kinds of psychology that can go into it. So you know, we are not, while we're not responsible for other people's feelings and other people's feeling offended, if you will. And that's, I think, how comedians feel and everything else. Like, I'm telling a joke. You don't like it, don't hear it. Don't listen to it. Right. Leave. And I'm kind of of that belief. Like, you know, you can say the exact same thing in two people that are very similar. One is going to be offended and one's not. Right. And the reason for that is like, what if you were talking about death and that person's, you know, family, somebody just recently died, mm -hmm. you know, or they, they have someone in their family who is of that situation or you know there's all kinds of so i think i mean as i talk a big amount a lot of a lot about resilience with children and mm -hmm. you know teaching them the, the self-confidence and all of that because like you shouldn't be offended right i may not like what you say i don't think it's nice but i'm not offended by it i'm not going to go you know protest mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah because we can't control other people right so I think in that context, you guys are both, you, you know, you both can be correct. You, for you, that wasn't your intention. You weren't thinking of it as a complaint for him. He sees it as a negative. He may have heard you complain a lot in the past. I mean, I don't know, whatever his context is. And so he just looks at it differently. And so we are allowed to look at things differently. That's yes. That's okay. That's one of the things that we also teach is looking at things from a different perspective because one day my stepkids said that I screamed at them or hollered at them. And what it was is I had told them to get up that morning and I wasn't as calm as their mama was when she woke them up. She wouldn't oh, cut sure. the light on. She would rub their back and <laughs> just peacefully 10 minutes, get them all up. Whereas right. I flipped the light on, open the door, rise and shine kids that ain't right. mine. And <laughs> He told his dad I yelled at him. And I'm like, I did not yell at him. And then it hit me. That was my perspective. Yeah. And there's something else that you said a minute ago about when we realize if we can change it or what we can do about it. And one thing that was hard for me was realizing that I was a big part of the problem in our blended challenges or struggles. And I could have looked at that as... Okay, the negative way. But thankfully, I looked at it as, wait a minute. That means that there's something I can do. With self-development, I can make this better. Right. Not only for myself, but for everybody around me. And I was going to say that, even if you don't, like in some instances, people don't, I don't say care, but they're like, let's say they're at their wits end and they don't really at the moment, care what other people feel or think, or, you know, even selfishly, you can be better off. Yes. You know, by following that kind of thing, like you can feel more calm. You can feel more at peace. You can feel more strength in, in who you are and what you're doing by learning those kinds of techniques. So even if you don't want to benefit everybody else, it, you know, which it will. Right. Because there's a lot of weight in that sometimes. Like, why am I doing, why do I have to do this so that everybody else feels better? Right. Well, Jason, thank you for being a guest. Well, thank you. That's been fun. I don't know if y'all noticed, but here lately, it seems that there's a lot of discussion about expectations. And lucky for you, we are creating an expectations 
course in the Nacho Kids Academy. I'd even turn one into a challenge. <laughs> you know, I started thinking, though, what's really the difference between a course and a challenge? Because I think a course is, here's, here's information, uh, go forth and prosper, whereas a challenge is more of, here's information and here's your homework. Come back tomorrow for more. <laughs> well, then I guess it's a challenge that I'm creating because you never don't have to do work. All right. You know, it's interesting when you, that you say that because um, I heard a person talk recently about the difference between knowledge and education. And basically, it comes down to whether or not you're actually using the information. And if you are consuming information but never putting that into use, then you actually aren't any better off than you were before. So if, if the, if the action of doing something with the knowledge means that you become better, better educated, all these other things, then, then not doing that means you just stand stupid. <laughs> Don't say it that way. <laughs> no, it is. This is the way it is. So if it's the, if you, if you're continuing and this, this is in, this is anything like if you're, whether you're reading a book or taking a course or, or whatever it is, if, if you're being presented with the information, but you're not doing anything at all with it, then how is it valuable at all? Well, but just because you're not using it today doesn't mean you won't use it later in life. No, I'm not saying it's something you're going to do later on. I'm saying you're not doing anything with it. And, and, okay. and where, where that comes into play a lot, and this is kind of outside of blended families, is, well, honestly, maybe not. because. There seems to be a prevalence, especially in January, where people are like, I'm going to read a book a week or I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to take in all these books this year. And, and because of that, I'll just become so much more knowledgeable. But is it better to let's just put a number on it. Is it better to read 52 books a year or is it better to read five, but fully implement everything you've learned in those five? And, I, and here's why I say that is what if you're taking in all these podcasts and you're listening to all these professionals, whether it's nacho related or not, but you're never actually putting anything into practice, then you're no better off than you were before. You're just, you just are exposed to knowledge, but you're not doing anything with it. So would that be considered educated? They're educating themselves, but they're not doing anything with it. So it's not knowledge. Is that correct? You're... You have the, <laughs> yeah, you have the knowledge, but you're not putting it in, into practice. And so you're not, you're no better off than you were before, except the fact that you were, you're an educated fool. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, it's almost better off. You're all, you're better off not knowing, right? It's I don't like know. It, it's like, you've... I don't, I don't know what to do. And therefore, because I don't know what to do, I, I'm not really held accountable for that. But once I know what to do and then I'm not doing it. That, that makes you, that makes it worse, really. So all that said, when you're listening to these podcasts or you're taking the courses in the academy or you're doing the challenges, whatever it is, stop and start implementing. You, you don't need somebody else to continually tell you the steps to take. Just take some steps. Right. Well, that's kind of like the challenge, the boot camp challenge. There's work in that. There's a lot of work in that. And that's how you learn these tools to use. I think if I'm relating this to business, what, okay. what I see, because a lot of what we do transcends more than just blended families, but what I often see in the business world is the reason why people are constantly reading books and watching videos and doing all these things, but never taking action is because they're waiting for that one silver bullet. The, the, give me the one thing that I need to do that's going to solve everything. They do that in business and I, they, and they do the same thing in blended families. Whereas it's just like, tell me this one thing I'm going to do that's going to turn my family completely around and we're going to be rainbows and unicorns. And it's going to be something that, you know, it's microwavable. It's going to right. be something I can do in five minutes and it's going to make all the difference in the world. And it's just not there, dude. It is not there. It, it doesn't yeah. exist. You're right. 
I get it. I understand that, Mr. Sims. All right. All right. So, that being said, you got to put the work in. Yep. Whether you know it or not, you put the work in to get into a bad place. <laughs> so, what about like me? I buy books and don't even read them. <laughs> I think it just makes you feel better to have them. It does. It makes me feel smart. Because <laughs> apparently I'm... Whatever you said earlier. <laughs> well, well, some people buy books, and I do this sometimes, where I buy books because I want to reference those books. Like I don't, I don't read books as much as I listen to them. And so, I mean, we don't, we won't get into a debate on whether or not you read or listen. You know, whatever. I often will will buy a, an audio book, and then if it's something I really like, I buy the physical book. Because I want to be able to use the physical book to reference back to, I can grab it off the shelf, look up something real quick, or I can look at things the audio book may have talked about, like look at chart on page, whatever. Well, I can't do that if I don't have the book. So mm-hmm. I'll, I will very often buy uh, the book for something I, that I've listened to. Matter of fact, I would say m- the vast majority of the books I have listened to and then bought the book. But that's, that's why I have them. I want to back up a second. You mentioned earlier about people trying to find the silver bullet. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed here lately that when someone posts in the Academy, I realized, and I don't know why it took me this long to realize that I can't answer their question in one response. I can't tell them what they need to do in a certain situation in one response because I have more questions. Mm Mm-hmm. One of the first questions I ask people when they tell us stuff is, how long have you been blending? How often do you have the step kids? Do you have bio kids? I've got kind of a little questionnaire I go through in my head because that helps me put things into perspective about their situation. Right. That's why we couldn't teach the Nacho Kids Method in the Facebook group by people asking those questions because we can't give you a one paragraph answer to help you. No, it's, it's too complex. And on top of that, you got people that they are looking for a specific answer. And if you don't give them what they want, they go ask somewhere else. Right. Which drives me nuts, but, you know. Or they get offended and whatever. And we see people do this, uh, that where they'll, they, they will uh, post a question like in the Facebook group, and then they'll post the same question in a different Facebook group, and then another question in another face. <laughs> yep. And I, you know, I, I get it. You're trying to get like a lot of different feedback and stuff like that, but I don't, the quality of the feedback most times is not good. Like you're right. asking, you're asking the wrong people for help. I saw a post yesterday, again, not blended family related, but it was a financial post a person went on Facebook and they made a post about, I'm trying to build my credit score. And this is a young, very young person trying to build my credit score and I'm and I'm going to go out and get a whole bunch of credit cards, but I want somebody to tell me what process do I need to follow. Which my f- <laughs> my first thought is just Google it. I mean, there's so much information, yeah. <laughs> but, but but maybe that's the problem. Honestly, these days is there is too much information, and so even understanding what to do is hard. But anyway, it was amazing to see how many people jumped into the fray with bad information or incomplete information or just you know again you're asking the masses you're not asking a professional right uh, to tell you in a short mm, summary yeah and and more most people who answered were people of her same age group which mm-hmm. the and those people had the worst answers and it wasn't necessarily that they were all wrong they were just they were either incomplete or they were you could just tell they look, you don't have a life experience in this area to really give a good answer. Right. Um, so it's it's like anything else in life. Find find those folks who can give you that feedback, who have that experience and can and can help you. Yeah, Laura Petheridge was talking one time about how this generation doesn't seem to value the knowledge their elders have as much as past generations. That's true. That's true. I, I like to tell people there's there's people who know things and there are people who understand things. And I th- I think we've gotten to where we we lump those two together. For example, if you were to ask me, um, 
do I understand how it feels to be pregnant? I can tell you, yeah, I can understand it because I can read a book or I can listen to it or I can have somebody tell me about it, whatever. So I can understand that. But do I know it? Do I know how it feels to be pregnant? Absolutely not. Do I know how it feels to whatever? No. Fill in the blanks. I don't. So knowing and understanding is very different. And a lot of people go to folks who understand blended families or who understand the challenges you're going through, but they don't know them. And I'm not saying that they're good or bad in their feedback. I'm just saying as a person that's seeking that sort of help, you need to make sure you're keeping that in mind. You're dealing with some people who understand and some people who know. We, you know, we're very clear about certain areas where we understand it. We don't know it. Right. For example, co-parenting. We talk about that often. We don't understand co-parenting to the degree that we know it. We didn't live that. We understand it from the perspective of everything we know and understand uh, uh, from other people and their experiences and our experiences in speaking with them. So we understand all that and we can give help and feedback and all that. But we don't know it firsthand. We didn't live that. Well, I want to clarify when you say co-parenting, we did have a co-parent, but we parallel parented. So yeah, yeah, yeah. parallel parenting is a type of co-parenting, they say, but it's not parenting together. So it's not really co-parenting, but I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> I don't know that you clarified it or not. <laughs> well, I've seen it and there's somebody said parallel parenting is a type of co-parenting. I'm like, uh, no. that's, like, that's like saying it's the an oxymoron. Lack, well, it's kind of the, the lack of parenting is a parenting style. Right. Yes. The, yeah. yeah. Or, or to not answer is an answer. <laughs> yeah. You get <laughs> do, it. Maybe they'll get yeah, it. Yeah. If you do nothing, that is an action. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, folks, we've kept you long enough. We yeah, hope we you have. have a great day. And David. Yeah, thanks for listening. Give us some feedback if you like this episode and uh, make sure you share it. Give us a review, all those good things. And uh, hey, shoot us an email. What do you think about some of the things we talked about? What's your take on it? We'd yeah. love to know. Yeah. We'd love to know. All right, so we'll see you again next week. Remember, life is good. When you nacho. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nacho Kids podcast. Find us online at nachokids.com. Until next time, remember, life is good when you nacho.